know, I love to say that everything remains the same, but it doesn't. I'd love to tell you that there'll always be, you know, Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie, that there'll always be these men of God, Raul Reese and Mike McIntosh, John Corson, that life will just keep going on and on, and it'll all remain the same. But it doesn't. You see, life is wearing down. If we look at history as our indicator, we see that throughout all of history in Christendom, any time that there was a great movement of God, there was also a great downward spiral that slowly but surely, once the leader or the initiator of that movement was gone, then things changed. And they changed dramatically. If you can look at any revival, you can see that once that person was gone, it had changed completely. Even now, we look at Billy Graham, and we look at Chuck Smith, and we look at these men that are in their 80s and 90s even, and we say, wow, what a marvelous fortitude that God has kept them around so long. How soon will the Lord return? Well, the blunt truth is, not until they leave. Because the fact is, that generation that saw Israel become a nation is the one that will exist during the time of the Lord's return for the rapture. But the generation that existed before it, I don't like to put it bluntly, but let's just say, if it happens to be so, then let it be true. And when we look at that, we see that when Luther was gone, then we had everybody saying what Luther did, and then changing what Luther was into what became Lutheranism, or Lutherans. When we talk about any of the Calvins, you know, I'm sure Calvin doesn't know what a Calvinist is, and I'm sure that other people don't know exactly what Armenians are, because Armenian, whoever started it originally, wasn't quite the same as the person now. And you never see the original being the same as the person. Jesus himself gave us a warning about that. He spoke bluntly. He said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Because you see, in these latter days, I know for myself, bluntly, without a shadow of a doubt, the Christianity of today has nothing to compare with of the Christianity in the original format when Jesus walked the earth. The reality is, is we've got a lot of compromise, a lot of things that have been added in to make it palatable for Americans and for Christianity today. Because we want to explain some of our own selfish desires and flesh. So we've added those things with grace and mercy and said that we could incorporate them into our lifestyle. But the truth is, if you really wanted to see what Christianity is all about, you'd have to look at a Catholic or maybe a Quaker. You know, some of the orthodox, you know, the ones that were, when we say get back to the basics, the ones that were really back to the basics. You know, denying yourself, taking up your cross, following Jesus that kind of methodology that we don't go for because hey, got some pretty nice duds there, dude. You know, <laughs> I don't want to give it up. And after all, I did buy them at the used store. But are we really so humble and are we really so prideful to not realize that once these things begin to happen, it'll be a lot like what the disciples went through. Did not the disciples themselves go through a time of great angst and frustration, a great time of kind of turmoil when they were challenged by the aspect that their leader was gone. Jesus had left. He was no longer giving them direct verbal communication. They were no longer speaking to him, but they were going by their own ideas sometimes, sometimes led by the Spirit, sometimes by religion. You see, the book of Acts has a lot of recorded acts of the apostles, but not all of it was directed by God himself, as you can be pretty much proven by just looking at sometimes the choices they made and the things that they did and the way they did them. I don't think that you could say that Paul fighting with Barnabas over Mark, you know, is a good thing, you know. Now, you could say that it all worked out for the best, but somehow getting this jealousy between Paul and Apollos just doesn't sound like the Christianity we know today, or does it? Do we not have great men and ministries right now doing the same thing? I mean, I know someone that you know everybody looks up to, like a John MacArthur, you know, and he likes to say that Billy Graham doesn't preach the gospel. 
you know. And now I hope he's recanted and changed that opinion because somehow it just cheapens his ministry. How sad it is. Or you know how many times people don't get over their personal pet peeves and then once they're gone, that's the part that's remembered about them. Wouldn't it be better if we all looked at Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith? Wouldn't it be better if we just focused in on the fact that we're living in the last days and we don't have that much farther to go and we need to just stick with what we know to do? Because you see, you look around and you don't see the unity of the body of the believers as much as we should. The longer that you stay in ministry, the more that you begin to bless people like John MacArthur and you bless Billy Graham and you bless Rick Warren and you bless those that even the ones that you don't necessarily agree with you learn that God takes care of it in His time, in His way. We're not the ones called to be responsible for another man's servant. Because if they claim that they're being led by the Lord, you leave them alone and let God decide what He will do with them. That is why we choose for ourselves to examine ourselves. We don't examine other men according to a standard that we set before them and say, look, this is what you measure up to. I want you to prove to me that you're a Christian based upon this is true and this is true and this is true and this is true. Now, you don't got those five points. I'm sorry, you're gone. We don't do inquisitions here. This is utmost versus highest. We talk about Jesus. We don't talk about churches. We don't talk about religion. We talk about following God in the way that he wants us to be. You may be a Catholic and you can stay in your Catholic church and you can be used by God right where you're at. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Same thing with Lutheran, same thing with Anglican, same thing with any other denomination that there is that all call upon the name of the Lord to be saved and have a salvation message that mandates that it be coming from the atoning sacrifice that Jesus has done upon the cross for the propitiation of sins. In that respect, 1 John applying, then yes, of course, stay where you're at. Do what God tells you to do. Accomplish the purpose that he designed you for. But don't get caught up in pointing at each other, fighting in-house, doing the things that cause consternation and frustration. Because it's going to happen. I'll be the first one to tell you. As soon as Billy Graham leaves and goes home to be with the Lord, the Billy Graham Association will fracture. Guaranteed. No problem there. I know that. Maybe you don't think so. Okay. Cool. Same thing with Calvary Chapels. If you think that, you know, when Chuck Smith leaves, that everything's already been settled and everything's all decided and everybody's just hunky-dory with all their little, you know, kind of fleshy little attitudes that were kind of like suppressed, you know, for so long that they don't come flaring up and some go fracturing out and suddenly change their names. Okay, maybe so, maybe you're right. Likewise, with you look at any of the other ministries that will be soon losing their great leader, whoever was that focused on them, whether it be Bill Bright with you know the Campus Crusade for Christ that has now changed their name and they're not quite the same effective. Or you look at some of the other ministries that have changed their names and Zola Levin Ministries that has suddenly backed away from being so hugely over the top that you don't hear much about it as you used to, do you? It's not quite as popular as it was. Or like we say into Jews for Jesus, you know, what happened to Moshe? Oh, well, we've got, you know, Jews for Jesus, but was it quite the same now? Or is it still a little bit now that we have David Brickner? Is it the same or is it different? So you see, there's an anointing that does come upon a certain man of God, and it seems to stay with them as long as they're alive. And that anointing sometimes is passed on to another, and sometimes that anointing that's passed on to another is even greater than that which was before. But you don't see too often those men of God giving like Elijah did to Elisha, the mantle of responsibility and anointing them with a greater measure of faith than what they had. Not too often. It happens, don't get me wrong. Some of the great men of God came out of what were small ministries to become huge ministries by way of the anointing being passed upon them. But we're not focused in on that. We're focused in on Jesus. Because you will see people begin to fragment, fracture, and draw up lines of contention and strife. They will begin to segregate themselves into small groups and separate themselves into austerity and austerity and prosperity. There will be the austerity doctrine that will come up and the prosperity doctrine where people will be at opposite extremes. One trying to make the kingdom of heaven on earth, the other trying to live for the kingdom that's to come. They will war with each other because you have 
in the greed and the need of people to manifest their own self-righteousness, they have to cover it up with something that comes out of theology. And the prosperity doctrine is the best way to do it. It covers all of these sins, and it's a multitudinous way of trying to hide underneath the mantle of grace a way to be selfish and get what you want and still accomplish the gospel. Because God will let you, technically. As long as you're sharing the gospel and you're declaring his name, he'll technically let you have your reward now. But don't expect much when you get to heaven. And do be reminded that, guess what? If you're into that kind of doctrine and that dogma that, you know, man-made and that you're getting into, and you think that you got, you know, wonderful suits and clothes and cars and jet planes and everything else for the ministry, Jesus still holds you accountable. You will stand before him. And if he does accept you, praise the Lord. I'm glad that you move into because I would rather that you be saved than to be condemned. But if he condemns you, no one's surprised. So be careful. The same thing with austerity when it becomes to the legalism point where they think that you have to become so poor that you're always going to be under self-regulated law and mandate of the ordinance of Christ that you come up with these Seventh-day Adventist ideas and this messianic legalism that causes you to go into where you have to think that you have to keep these certain rules and regulations and laws that God has mandated from the Ten Commandments onward all the way up into the Halachot that these guys get so carried away that they make God into the law rather than take grace and apply it with mercy. For the loving kindness of the Lord shall endure forever. His loving kindness endures forever. That's what the Jew kept saying because they knew that you couldn't live up to the law. His loving kindness endures forever because they needed it to endure forever. His mercy endures forever because they needed mercy. They knew that. But the modern person doesn't. So in these latter days, when you start seeing these things begin to happen, and they're going to happen soon, maybe not right in 2012, because 2012 is more about political power and kind of the manipulation of the world systems to get things kind of organized in a certain format and formula where you see nobody's really a strong leader, but everybody is miry clay. And no matter where you look at whatever system you look at, it's always miry clay. Whether it be the financial, whether it be the political, whether it be the social, whether it be the religious, it is miry clay. The time of strong leaderships is gone. People are miry clay. Daniel's vision of the future has come true. And we're into that place where the ten toes were made of miry clay. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. And guess what? Right before they become completely devastated so that they can be turned over to Jesus himself when he comes to set up his kingdom, it would be miry clay. And that stone that comes out of heaven that is cast down at the foot of it and causes it all to crumble, it will fall apart because it is made of miry clay. We do call that democracy, by the way. It is where the people rule. Because a single ruler, strong in enforcement, is what God intended. Single. Not my, not democracy, not the people, but one person. Appointed, anointed, and directed by God. It is not about democracy. It's not about popular vote. Sorry, that's just the way the biblical scriptures are written. That's the way it is. That's the way God does things. He shares his authority with no one. He is in control. We are not. When you use people for your medium of trying to self-govern, then you're going to wind up with the people governing you. And that's forced enforcement of legalism. Democracy has always been legalism. It's legalistic. It is not freedom. Democracy has never been about freedom. It's been about the legislative legalistic system. It is a legislature of legalism. That's the way it is. Theocracy is about the legislative determination by a god determining what the destiny of a man will be. That's just the way it is. So, the reason why we want to focus in and we want to develop our relationship with God to such an utmost extreme because we want to go out with a bang. Don't you? I mean, we want to go out with joy. Don't you? I want to go out with love. Man, don't you? I want to go out with the peace, the love, and the joy, and the excitement, knowing that Jesus is coming, and that I'm not distracted by the world and its complete, utter, chaotic mess that it's going to fall into and get all wrapped up and deceived and confused and abused about. But rather, I'm going to stick with what's been true from the beginning, with what we know has been always there in us. Jesus alive and well, speaking to us one to one as we walk with God and talk with God. Because it's not about us or them, but it's about making choices. You can choose to spend your time wrapped up in the religious aspect of the world that's going to 
Oh, well, now who's going to we, who are we going to put in charge? What are we going to call ourselves? What kind of name will we have? What kind of reputation? What kind of doctrines are we going to carry? Even as you watch the Crystal Cathedral fall apart and its monetary base disappear, once they took the name out and the people left, guess what? They divided themselves along filial or family relationships. One person went here, the other person went there, and the church itself is crumbling. It's being turned over to the Catholic Church. All leaders, once they begin to step out of that ministry, the anointing is gone. The same thing happened to the Jews. It's always been something you can look back in the Old Testament and you can see it throughout all of history. It's happened in Christendom over and over and over again. It's a consistent pattern. We can look at it and we can see how it works so we can be aware of it. Because even in, always, the times and the signs that we live in these latter days, there's always been those that God has spoken direct to because God has always chosen to be personal, not corporal. When Jesus speaks to the seven letters to the seven churches, he doesn't speak to the corporate church and say, this is what I want you to do. He says to the individuals in it. He blesses the church for what it's done, but he speaks to the individual overcomers in each one of the churches. He's personal, one-to-one. -one. And that's why we want to be personal with God always. We enjoy where we're going to church. We enjoy the fellowship of the brethren. We enjoy being assembling together of ourselves into common expressions of faith. But at the same time, we have our personal relationship. So when things begin to fracture, don't lose your cookies. Don't lose your mind. Don't lose your faith. Don't lose it like the disciples did when their Lord and Savior was crucified. But rather, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on your own understanding and always acknowledge Him. And He'll direct your path in these times that we're living in because it's going to come upon us very fast. Once they start falling like dominoes, <laughs> and I don't like to talk about these great men of God in our hallmarks of faith that we've lived in in this blessed in this generation, whether it be Dobson and, and Missler or well, all these older guys, you know, old men like me, you know, I mean, they're older than I am, so they're old, <laughs> I'm an old man, you know, at least my wife keeps telling me I'm an old man, and I keep saying, no I'm not, honey, look at my address, <laughs> but uh, she keeps telling me I'm an old man, so all these guys that are older than I am, hey, you guys are out of luck, man, you got to kick the bucket so I can get out of here, because <laughs> you see, I don't fear death, I think that it's a blessing. And Chuck Smith used to talk the same way, so I'm pretty sure that he still looks at it as like, don't resurrect him, he's looking forward to going home. <laughs> Those borders of distrust, behold, the hour cometh that you shall be scattered. John 16, 32. Jesus is not rebuking the disciples. Their faith was real, but it was disturbed. It was not at work in actual things, the disciples were scattered to their own interests, alive to interests that never were in Jesus himself. After we have been perfectly related to God in sanctification, our faith has to be worked out in the actual working out of the day-to-day -day existence. We have to live like we believe. We shall be scattered. That is a fact. You shall be scattered. Not into work, but into the inner desolations and made to know what internal death to God and God's blessing means. You will find yourself feeling as though God had left you and you were all alone. You will face your Gethsemane. You think that having been in ministry, you've already been there because you went through that time of leanness of soul to bring you to an utter dependence upon God. But when God removes his blessing from you, then you'll know. Are we prepared for this? Is it not that we choose it, but that God engineers our circumstances so that we are brought there? So irregardless of how we think we are, God brings us there because he desires to teach us, to lead us, and to leave us, to stand. And having done all, to stand. Until we have been through that experience, our faith is bolstered up by feelings and by blessings. As long as God blesses us, and he did in the end, we're there. But what if the blessing doesn't come? When once we get there, no matter where God places us or what the inner desolations are, we can praise God that all is well. We can if we choose to. That is faith being worked out in the actualities. When these men of God and great men that they are, all of them, have left us, what will we do with our faith? Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? 
We would not have said that 10 years ago when we were talking about focus in on the family and the great heyday of what it was doing in its heightened ministry. We wouldn't have said that in the Chuck Colson days when the great ministry, the prison ministry and the things that he was doing was in its peak. We would not have said that in Campus Crusade for Christ when it was all the rage and everyone was going with Bill Bright and the four spiritual laws. We would not have said that at the beginning or in the middle or at the near end of the Calvary Chapel movement when you see that the Jesus people had become men and women of God and their generations were growing up as men and women of God. We would not have said that about the Billy Graham Association at the great revivals that had gone on throughout the world. Until now we see at the end of his life, not so many. So, what would we say to these things? That we shall stand as they did when our time comes to stand alone as a witness for Jesus. Your utmost for his highest depends upon that. You will be brought to the uttermost end of your faith in order that you may demonstrate the reality of Jesus in you. And shall leave me alone. Have we left Jesus alone by the scattering of his providence? Because we do not see God in our circumstances? Darkness comes by the sovereignty of God. Are we prepared to let God do as he likes with us? Prepared to be separated from conscious blessing until even the very center of our being we suspect that we are all alone. When we feel absolutely in the darkness, will we stand for the light? Are we prepared to let God do as he likes? Until Jesus Christ is Lord, we all have ends of our own to serve. Our faith, our ministry, our realities. Our faith is real, but it is not permanent yet. It has not been tried on the cross. It has been brought to that place of testings, but until it is absent of all feelings, is it faith indeed? God is never in a hurry. If we wait, we shall see that God is pointing out that we have not been interested in himself, but only in his blessings, in the ministry, in the feelings we had, in the, the sustaining power of God that was in us, that the Holy Spirit was filling us. But when you don't feel the Spirit anymore, when you don't have that inside, when you are left behind, will you still follow God? For you see, not everyone will go into rapture. I don't know if you will, and I don't know if I will. It's up to the Lord Jesus himself to decide. It's not for my choice. I pray I be counted worthy to be spared of these things that are coming upon the whole world, as Paul said. But it's not for me to determine who shall or shall not. It's for God to decide. But whether I live or whether I die, whether I go in the rapture or whether I don't, I will stand for Jesus because I'll still be doing this the same time afterwards that I would be doing beforewards. Because as I live and breathe and have and move my being, I will always declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And for that, I will stand irregardless of faith, feelings, fact, or realities. Always will I cling to that because I have known Jesus my heart of hearts and I have no despair of my faith the sense of God's blessing is elemental be of good cheer I have overcome the world spiritual grit is what we need there will come a time in your faith where you will have to tough it out you'll have to grit it out it won't be a matter of feeling happy and jab happy and jumpy and joyful and running and laughing and dancing and singing. It won't be about your iPods and your iMacs and your earbuds and making up all these cute little limericks and rhymes and songs. It'll about, be about the reality of death facing you and despair in front of you. When the rubber meets the road of your faith and God says to you, nothing and you don't sense his presence anymore. And you don't feel God with you anymore. And you despair for the reality of the circumstances that you are in. Prepare yourself. God's bringing you there. You are going to go through it. It will happen. But it will be, like Jesus said, be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. If God has died, then God also has lived. And if God has been resurrected from the dead, you will too.